Is there anyone that did not pick up the community? If you didn't, please raise your hand and somebody will comment. Okay, over there. And you all should have an outline as much as it is. I don't know. A couple lines on for you to fill out here and there. Okay, good morning. Good morning. Good morning to those of you who are looking on the internet as well. Good to see you and glad that you are here. Ah, there we go. And I want you just to pray. Bible Baptist Church in Shiksin needs your prayers, even right now, as we're here. Their pastor in the past week has been arrested, charged with child abuse. That happened about 13 years ago. We just pray for those folks. He would. Throughout the week, they do need your prayers. Who, what, when, where, and why? If you do a Google search on those five words, you are going to get 5,120,000,000 hits. And it's going to take that Google search engine exactly 0.55 seconds to come up with those words. Those words. Journalists look at those words constantly. If you're writing a newspaper article, especially a news release, you need to remember who, what, when, where. It's just the way it is. When you read a newspaper, you'll find those answers in the first couple sentences. Not only that, they become more important in essays. We don't have a lot of young people here this morning, but I'm sure that if I were to ask them what a TBA was, they could tell me. Because in the ESSA testing, in a lot of the teaching in English language arts, TBA is important. Text dependent analysis. And you need those words where, why, how, and so on. Today, I come to some more important questions for you. More than a news story and more than an essay. Three simple questions. Where, how, who? We're going to look this morning at Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 24. I'm going to read them from the New King James Version. If you don't have a Bible to look at, you can flip the outline over, and then on the back there is another version, a newer version, of that same passage of Scripture. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be dark, full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. Now you didn't see those questions in here. But those questions are, here are, where is your heart? How is your eye? And who is in charge? John Newton in the 18th century, when he stood up to preach, said this. And I want you to listen to the words because I want to say the same thing, but he said it better. Mm -hmm. I count it my honor and happiness that I preach to a free people who have the Bible in their hands. To your Bibles, I appeal. Just a side note. Bibles were not readily available to people up until 1450 when Gutenberg made the first Newton who wrote Amazing Grace was preaching. The people had a Bible, and you and I have Bibles today. If you don't have a Bible, that's a book. We have a Bible on our cell phones. We have Bibles in our readers, whatever. He says, I appeal, I entreat, I charge you to receive nothing upon my word any farther 
that I can prove from the Word of God to bring every preacher and every sermon that you hear to the same standard. And that's what I would say to you today. Let us pray. Father, as we come to your Word, we pray that you might speak to us through, challenge us through, and guide us in our daily lives. In our Savior's name we pray. Amen. Look at verses 19 and 20. Do not light up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust corrupts or destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Jesus is telling us to be more concerned about the treasure in heaven than treasure on earth. It means using a different value system than the world uses. Warren Wiersbe has said it means measuring life by the true riches of the kingdom and not by the false riches of this world. Where is your heart? That's a question that permeates Jesus' teaching in this Sermon on the Mount. Now, before you go feeling for your heart, think again. This is not an anatomy quiz. It's not the kind of answer a cardiologist would like either. Get out that fancy stethoscope that's cost them several hundred dollars <laughs> or more. Rather, it's the kind of answer that any young woman would hope to receive from her boyfriend, especially around February 14th. When she goes out to her mailbox, she wants that card that's there with his heart expression on it. So where is your heart? Look at verse 21 of Matthew chapter 6. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Perhaps you've never really thought about it. If not, now is the time to begin thinking about that question. Let's put it another way. What's number one in your life? Who's number one? What would you miss the most in life that were taken away from you? What consumes most of your time and energy? What's right there in the center of your affection? Answer those questions, and you can be well near the kind of answer that Jesus wants from his question. Now, if you're honest and beginning to think, chances are you realize your heart is set on a thing. 21st century man is very, very, on the whole, very think conscious. Jeff Treasure, in his book, and I referred to this last week, right, Living Right Side Up, wrote a thing about things. It's a long quote, but I want to read it to you because I find it very interesting. <clears throat> Let me introduce you to Mr. and Mrs. Thing, a very pleasant and successful couple. At least that's what the verdict is of most people who tend to measure success on a thingometer. And when the thingometer is put to work in the life of Mr. and Mrs. Thing, the result is startling. There he is, sitting down on a luxurious and very expensive thing, almost hidden by the large number of things surrounding him on all sides. Things to sit on, things to sit at, things to cook on, things to eat from, all shining and new. Things, things, things. Things to clean with, things to wash with, things to clean and things to wash. Things to amuse and things to give pleasure with. Things to watch and things to play. Things for the long, hot summers. Things for the short, cold winters. Things for the big thing in which they live. <coughs> things for the garden. Things for the lounge. Things for the kitchen. Things for the bedroom. Things on four wheels. Things on two wheels. Things to put on top of the four wheels. <laughs> things to pull behind the four wheels. <laughs> things to add to the interior of the thing on four wheels. Things, things, things. And there in the middle are Mr. and Mrs. Things. Smiling, pleased with themselves, thinking of more things to add to their collection. Their view limited by things to those things they can feel, touch, and see. Their heart taken up completely by things, things and more things. Security in a castle of things. Well, Mr. Fitt, I've got some bad news for you. What's that? You can't hear me? The things are in the way? I'll shout a little more loudly because I'm not as confident as you appear to be about the security afforded by your castle of things. 
Surely you, for one, should understand what I mean. Remember those two large things a few miles away? They were worth a tidy sum, weren't they? That was until a demolition expert who did to widen the road for the increasing number of four-wheel things that passed that way. The owners protested, of course, that their words were little match for the authorities and the machines. Here today and gone tomorrow. tomorrow. Workmen and those two things yesterday desirable, but today demolished. But then, that's the problem of things. Look at that thing standing outside your house. Whatever is value to the second-hand thing dealer, it means a lot to you. But then an error in judgment, a temporary loss of concentration, and that thing could be a massive mangled metal being towed off to the junkyard. What about all those things in your house? Are they any more secure? Yes, time for bed. Put out the cat. But also make sure you lock the door. And don't forget the windows. Watch out, there's a thief about it. But today's thief doesn't just fill his pockets. He has large bags, maybe even a car to be filled. What graces your house today will well be disgracing his house tomorrow. George Carlin, not one of my favorite comedians because he's vulgar and foul mouth, he describes our houses as a pile of stuff with a roof on. And what happens? The stuff gets too much, then we have to buy a bigger house and put more stuff in. And then if we don't, that doesn't work, we get one of those storage units we rent. <laughs> now, my press enterprise phone book, I opened it up to the yellow pages. And I counted a full page, I saw a full, almost a full page, and I counted 28 different places that rent storage units. And now, beloved, if you go out of church, go on Route 11, turn toward Bloomsburg, look on the right hand side, you will see a whole collection of new storage units. As near as I can calculate, and looking at the numbers on those units as I go by, there are at least 243 units here. We're storing things, stuff. We are a very materialistic, thing-oriented society. I can recall my first computer. Ah, there it is. My first computer was marvelous. Can you see this little thing? It has more memory in it than my computer had. We always need better and better. I can recall as a child, now I'm a little older than some of you, a little. A lot, maybe. I can recall the first car we got. One of those used cars, a 1940 Chevrolet sedan. I believe, yeah. And then I can recall my family's first refrigerator. Man, we were up in the world, man. We got rid of the icebox. Ordered a refrigerator from Sears and Roebuck catalog. It got delivered by Railway Express and it ended up at the rail station. My dad had to get rent a truck or buy a truck or steep. No, got somebody that had a truck to go and pick it up and bring it to our house. And then the first automatic washer. No longer was that render washer sitting in the middle of the kitchen with tubs all around it. But my mother still had to use a shoulder dryer. You know, the clothesline that went from the front to the back of the house, to the yard. And believe it or not, I can remember the first telephone. And I can tell you the number today. 89J. Because it was a party line. I can remember that phone number, but I can't remember the password I gave some places yesterday. <laughs> You know, we needed a lot less things 50 years ago, 20 years ago, even five years ago. Compared to many in this world, we are very, very well. I'm going to give you some comparisons. 
If you have a non-dirt floor in the place you live, you belong to the upper half of the world's most prosperous people. Now, if you have a window, a door, and more than one room, you belong to the upper 20% of the world's richest people. If you have food in the refrigerator, clothes on your back, a roof over your head, and a place to sleep, you are richer than 57% of the world. Now, if you have money in the bank, in your wallet, and spare change in dish someplace, you are among the top 8% of the world's most wealthy. Regardless of where you live, if you can read, and have a pair of shoes, a change of underwear, and can choose from two or more foods to eat, you belong in the top 10% of the world's most wealth. Scary thought, isn't it? I've had the privilege of being with some of these people that don't have that stuff. I can remember looking at a man in church when I was in Costa Rica. He didn't have shoes. He was sitting there in his bare feet. I can remember going to a little house to have a, uh, like a worship service on a Sunday morning. And lady had a table in front of the house, in the front of the room that we were in. Benches, I don't know where she got the benches or where the people got the benches. Guess what the table cover was on the table that was in front of the room? A big banana leaf. We don't know, beloved, how most of the world lives. Are we, the question is, laying up treasures in heaven as rapidly as we desire to build up treasures here? Second question Jesus asked. Well, I'm going to make a question. How is your eye? Verse 22. The lamp of the body is the eye. If your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. If your eye is bad, the whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? December 4th, 2016, when I had a stroke, I suddenly realized and became aware of how important my eyes were. <coughs> I had trouble reading. I had trouble walking. And the walking wasn't because of my legs. It was because of my eyes. My left eye would look right and not go left. My right eye, I kept closed so I could see a little bit because I couldn't see much at all out of my right eye. I got out of the hospital, out of the rehab hospital, Christmas Eve service. I went to the service. And suddenly we're doing a candlelight service. Somebody's out there with a candle lit, and I'm trying to find a place to put my candle to light it. I don't know for how many months when we had communion in our church, my daughter would pick up two pieces of bread and two cups, and I just passed the plate. Driving? Oh, forget that. When our eyes are fixed on something, we get our bearing. And everything is clear and plain. But when you can't focus on the thing, rather you see two images of the same thing, it makes it difficult to do much of anything. The eye affects balance. I know the ears do, but the eyes do too. And coordination. It's hard to avoid walking into something. It's on your left side. You only see he is. You only see his right. But Jesus in this passage is dealing with more than physical sight. Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of these verses is this: Your eyes are windows into your body. If you open your eyes wide in wonder and belief, your body fills up with light. If you live squinty-eyed in greed and distrust, your body is a dank cell. 
If you pull the blinds on your windows, what a dark life you will live. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 32, or 22. A man with an evil eye hastens after riches and does not consider that poverty will come upon him. Okay, where is your heart? How's your eye? The third question this morning is, who's in charge? Who is in charge? Verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and Mammon in the King James, a more accurate translation to us today, you cannot serve God and money. The word serve here means be a slave to. We can only have one master. Jesus challenged us in the entire Sermon on the Mount to change our minds about earthly treasures, about the things that we formerly served, and to serve him only. You cannot serve both no matter how hard you try. One or the other is going to lose out. And in most cases, it will be God. One of the worst train disasters in history occurred in the El Toro Tunnel in Leon, Spain, Leon, excuse me, Spain, on January 3rd, 1944. Over 500 people died. <laughs> On our way to church this morning, I have to tell you this. We're driving up to Buckhorn, coming onto the <coughs> stop sign for Walmart, and off the road comes, off the 80, comes a tractor trailer. On the back of it is a big, massive train car. Wide load. It's going somewhere. I don't know where. It looks like an Amtrak car. Let's get back to my Leon. Okay. <laughs> The train was one of those long passenger trains with a steam engine on both ends. On this particular day, when the train went into the El Toro Tunnel, the engine on the front stalled. When the front engine stopped, the engineer in the back engine started up his engine to back out of the tunnel. At the same time, however, the front engineer managed to get the front engine started again, and at the end of the continued journey. Neither engineer had any way of communicating, 1944, remember, with the other. Both engineers thought they simply needed more power. They continued to pull in both directions for several minutes. Hundreds of passengers on the train in the tunnel died of carbon monoxide poisoning because the train could not make up its mind which way to go. The people on that train died because they had one too many engineers. <coughs> We can't serve God and also serve the devil. He's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. One more illustration. T. Martin Lloyd Jones records this story in a study in the Sermon on the Mount. I remember once hearing a preacher tell a story which he assured us was simple, literal truth. It illustrates perfectly the point that we're considering. Story of a farmer, when one day he came home happily and grieved his, had great joy in his heart to report to his wife and family that their best cow had given birth to twin <coughs> calves, one red, one white. And he said, you know, I have suddenly had a feeling and an impulse that we must dedicate one of those cows, calves to the Lord. We will bring them up together, and when the time comes, we will sell one, keep the proceeds, we'll sell the other, and give the proceeds to the Lord's work. So I asked him that she was going to dedicate to the Lord. Ah, oh, there's no need to bother with that now, he replied. We will treat them both the same way. And when the time comes, we will do as I say. And off he went. In a few months, the man entered the kitchen looking very miserable and unhappy. When I asked him what was troubling him, he answered, I have bad news to give you. The Lord's calf is dead. But she said, you had not decided which was to be the Lord's calf. Oh, yes, he said. I had always decided it was to be the white one. And it's the white one that has died. The Lord's calf <coughs> is dead. Now, we can laugh at that story. But God forbid that we should be laughing at ourselves. It's always the Lord's calf that dies. When money becomes difficult, the first thing we tend to economize on is our contribution to God's work. Three questions to think about this morning. 
Where is your heart? How's your eye? And who's in charge? Let's pray. Father, as we come to you, we would commit ourselves to you, asking that we might realize that it's only when you're in charge that things work. It's only when our eyes are open to light and brightness in your word that things go well. And it's only when our heart is in tune with you that we will lay up treasure in heaven. Father, we pray that we all may commit ourselves to do just that in our lives today. We ask this in our Savior's precious name. Amen. Last Sunday was Independence Day. In the May, we celebrated Memorial Day. <coughs> and I got to thinking about memorials. Many of the people in the Old Testament made memorials. What's the first thing Noah did when he came off the ark? Build an altar, a memorial to God. Mm -hmm. As you move through the Old Testament, when Joshua crosses the Jordan to enter the Promised Land, he has 12 men, one from each tribe, go back into that river, pick out 12 stones, and build a monument. So that when the people looked later, the children, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren, they would see that God had brought them out of here, through the Jordan River into his Promised Land. One of my favorite memorials, because I grew up in Mount Carmel, attending the Ebenezer Mennonite Brethren in Christ Church, which is now Bethany Bible Fellowship Church. In 1 Samuel, we read about Samuel. The ark had been captured by the Philistines. It was brought back. Samuel was having a meeting with a lot of the people where the ark was stayed for many years. And the Philistines thought they were going to attack them. So they got around them. They were going to attack them. Israel had no army at that time. No leader, except for Samuel. And they prayed. And Baal, the god of thunder, whom these Philistines worshipped, God sent thunder in the sky. And they gone. The end of that, Samuel takes a stone and builds it up and he sets it up. He said, This is Ebenezer. Hitherto our God has helped us, and he will help us. But there's one memorial in the Old Testament that comes even earlier than that. When the children of Israel are in Egypt, and God brings them out of Egypt. He establishes a memorial. That memorial, the Passover. Where every year, even to this day, people celebrate their coming out of Egypt. It was when Jesus Christ was on earth, just before he died, he celebrated the Passover with his disciples. And at that time, he took bread and said, this is my body. He took the cup of salvation and shared it with them and said, this is my blood which is shed for them. And he established what we have come to call the Last Supper, communion, the Eucharist, and so on. And it's that which we want to do right now. Commemorate the Lord's Supper. We're going to do it just a little bit different than we've been doing in the last couple of months. Hopefully, I've got a dozen of these here. Is one of these yours, sir? I'd like you to take this, and hopefully, we're going to get rid of these. But one of the reasons we use these cups now is because of COVID. And this prevents us from passing the plates 
and people getting their fingers on the bread than they should. Now you get that little shiny, little silver thing, that clear thing, peel it back, and then there is a wafer, which is supposed to be bread. And it is what we have today. Jesus, when he took the bread, he gave thanks and break it. He said to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. This too will be known as a meal. Let us partake of the bread. First, you've been looking at the words on the screen. When we take the word supper, we commemorate his death and his resurrection. In the first Corinthians, Paul says, when we take the supper, we do the communion, we proclaim the Lord's death. After they took the bread, same manner he took the cup, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This too as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. He took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. Every one of us will share it with us. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the memorial, the cup, the bread, which your son, Jesus Christ, shared with his disciples. And a reminder that it is to us what you have done for us. May we, even ourselves, to proclaiming your love, your concern, and your compassion to those who have never been. In our Savior's most precious name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed. Remember the offering plates in the back? And there probably should be some. Oh, I see it. Trash cans right at the door. The disposal of people.